Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is income. I'm going to start with a little bit of big picture um, because I think some of the points that Russ made there are very valid. And they do have a very interesting um, indicator, if you like, towards the emerging markets and people's risk appetite. Um, I'm probably going to be a little bit more negative, I think, probably than Russ, um, but, but on the broader equity valuation level. Uh, and then draw your attention, hopefully, successfully, um, hopefully, to the fact that actually there's quite a lot of value still sitting in Asia. Um, and within that, actually, income is probably the most compelling part of it. So I know how many slides I've got, and I know I've only got 20 minutes. So uh, without further ado, so 2016, a difficult year. Um, no big surprise. Uh, I, I, and this is probably the first point about being slightly cautious is I can't believe that we've had the things we've had in 2016, yet equity markets are at record highs. Something doesn't compute here. You know, I've been managing money for 23 years. If we'd had Brexit, if we'd had Trump, if we'd had the problems in the Middle East, et cetera, would you normally expect to see equity valuations at record highs? I would argue that's highly unusual <laughs> and probably makes me slightly nervous. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm not going to talk about the headwinds too much here because, as you can see, you, know, you all know what they are uh, and everyone debates them on a regular basis. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about the positives. But before I do that, let's just talk about what happened in 2016. Um, I'm an active fund manager. I know, obviously, uh, quite a few of you invest in ETFs and we're about to hear about ETFs going forward. Um, but when you get moves in markets like we've seen through 2016, where different styles went out at different times, it's really difficult, especially for me, if you're, for example, you know, I'm an income investor, so I know my shareholders care about income. So you know, my flexibility of going into value or cyclicals isn't that great. So when I see things like um, this move, which we saw from the middle of this year, from cyclical, well, sorry, from defensives into cyclicals, I mean, that's a massive, massive move. And you could argue, as Russ alluded to, that actually we haven't actually seen any change in growth expectations but prompting this huge move. All we've seen is a steepening yield curve and maybe the expectation of growth and in interest rates. But to be honest, there's no evidence of it. But because we had such severe positioning, if you like, in markets prior to that, everyone was looking for yield, interest rates were too low, so everyone was pushed into yield stocks, we got unsustainable levels of, uh, of bond yields, unsustainable levels of dividend yields. So what we have here is a switch back into cyclicality, into growth. I would question as to whether there's actually evidence that this is actually happening or whether it's just a case of money moving out of something that's over-owned into under-owned. And this is another thing that worries me. So. I'm not, I promise you I'm not going to make this too negative. Um, <laughs> but it hasn't started well, has it? Um, so this is world performance breakdown uh, for 2016 year to date, broken down into three factors. So the contribution of your share price return. So on the left there, you've got Thailand, 20% return year to date. Down here, you've got the Philippines. And the different colored bars are the contribution to that. So uh, orange bars are PE, i.e. as the market got cheaper. If it's, a, if it's a positive bar, the market's got more expensive. If it's a negative bar, it's got cheaper. The contribution from earnings is the slightly browny color. Um, so basically, has this move been, uh, been based on, on an improvement in earnings? Um, and then, obviously, you've got currency, which is obviously all, all over the place. But the thing that worries me is the, the prominence of the orange, i.e., Earnings support, in a lot of cases, is negative. I mean, there's a few that aren't. The USA, in this case, is actually more positive, as, as Russ said. But most of it is markets just getting more expensive. Little or no earnings support. And I would argue that in order to justify the valuations that Ru Russ showed earlier, you need to start seeing some earnings. And I think when you look at the forecast for the US, in particular, equity market, it doesn't look great. So can we justify these current levels of valuations based on people's assumptions of earnings? Now, this is where I'm going to go into something slightly more positive. And clearly, obviously, a bit of vested interest here, because I'm going to talk about Asia. Now, 
Some of the reasons why Asia and emerging markets have underperformed over the last five or six years is mainly because earnings have disappointed. And people have thought to themselves, well, look, I'm going to pay, if I'm going to pay for that extra little bit of risk, I want growth to justify that. But actually, growth has been negative. So this is analysts' expectations of 2016's earnings since 2014, how they've changed. So in 2014, they thought there was, this is rebased to 100. They thought there was going to be this level of growth, but gradually as we went through 2015 and 16 all the way through, those numbers got ratcheted down. So why be in Asia and emerging markets when that growth profile is still negative? But the reason to be a little bit more optimistic is some of the earnings are waning elsewhere is that actually we've seen stabilization from the middle of this year. And in some cases, in the case of Korea, we've started to see decent improvement. Now, Korea is a, a pretty good um, indicator because it's quite a cyclical market, um, which would give you a bit more po uh, positivity about the cycle. But even so, um, there's a lot of bottoming out of earnings here and generally some improvement. <coughs> Excellent. Um, so let me talk to you about another um, assumption that people make, is that emerging markets in Asia can't do well if the US dollar is strong. Um, and if you look back over time, over history, uh, this goes back to 87, but if you go back longer, that's generally the case. You average all these out, and it's a negative. Rising dollar, emerging markets in Asia underperform. However, you need to look at it in a bit more detail because it does depend on why the US dollar is strengthening. And usually, the US dollar strengthens for two reasons. Firstly, when everything goes wrong, the US dollar and the US economy is deemed to be a store of value. So a risk-off moment usually means a strong US dollar. Now, as you can imagine, universally, that is negative for risk assets, the emerging markets in Asia. So in that case, bad. Um, a bad environment, rising dollar, underperforming EM in Asia. However, when US, US um, currency is rising because there's, there is the assumption that growth will improve or rates will rise, then that is not universally a negative. In fact, in some cases, more recently, can be a positive. So a lot of people say to you, rising dollar, don't go anywhere near Asia and emerging markets. If it's rising because there's an improvement in the cycle. As you can imagine, Asia is very trade orientated. That's not bad news. <clears throat> Valuations, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Very little, actually, because I've just seen I've done seven minutes, and I know how many slides I've got left. But the relative case has kind of been somewhat undermined a little bit recently. This is the relative PE of Asia compared to the rest of the world. So, you know, at the beginning of this year, Asia was very cheap, and as we have had some outperformance. Um, but you know, still pretty cheap relative to history. Um, and this over here just kind of highlights why Asia underperformed. This is the return on equity. So back in 2010, um, return on equity in Asia was higher than it was in the US. But that's come all the way down over the last five years. And as a result, valuations have come with it. So what else is happening in Asia which is positive? Well. I've been managing money in Asia for 23 years, and I've never seen the combination of reforms we have in the Asian econo economies that we currently do now. So, I mean, the question is, is whether you believe it, and when I talk about China, you know, I'm sure we're going to have a diverse opinion as to whether China actually means reform. Um, but there is a lot of change taking place there. There's a lot of change taking place in India, a lot of change place, taking place in Thailand, not all of it good, I have to say. Indonesia, the same. Um, and Korea. Um, Korea is a market which has been very alien to foreign investors for a number of years, but that's opening up at quite a speed, and that's a big, big change. So we have these structural reforms taking place in Asia, um, and, why, and one of the reasons why Asia, I think, has always traded at a discount is because people don't have the confidence in the governance, the transparency. But these reforms will hopefully kind of bridge that gap to what we expect in the West, um, and as a result, the valuation differential can close as a result. Um, and I'm going to give you a really blue sky scenario now. Um, please don't think this is going to happen in the next five years, because otherwise I'll be on a yacht somewhere, I can assure you. But if you think about what's happened in the UK and the US since 2008, 
the whole experiment with QE, compressing yields down to very low levels and uh, abundant liquidity, forcing people like you, people like me, into alternative asset classes to search for yield. Which has seen property prices go up, as we've seen. You know, you, I don't know if any of you look at classic cars, but if you've seen the price of those, they're outrageous. Art, wine, this kind of stuff, and that's you know kind of the side effect of QE. But everyone expects it to be a kind of Western phenomenon. It's Western savers. Well, actually, there's much more savers in Asia than there are in the UK. Asian savers have been funding US and UK debt now for about the last 10, 15 years. So what? happens if we get the same phenomenon in Asia. This is just a, a little look at China. Now, China is quite interesting because it's a closed capital account, so most people can't invest outside China. Most, not all, clearly, because we've seen the, what's happened with Battersea pricing, etc. So we know the Chinese do invest, but most can't. And so this is virtually the whole universe of asset-bearing investments. And this includes property, includes bonds, it includes wealth management products, cash. And basically, yields have come all the way down. So if you wanted to invest in Shanghai property, for example, not Shanghai, but tier one, so the Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, basically, yield on property is about 2%. That's even unattractive by London standards. Um, wealth management products, which were very popular because of the levels of yield, governments clamped down on that. So now you have to buy bank issued wealth management products. They used to yield you six. They now yield you four. So this, this investment universe has kind of shrunk. The opportunity has disappeared, if you like, for people to uplift their yield in the same way as it did here. But the thing that's really blue sky about this is when you look at the scale of the savings that sit in Asia. To give you an example, this is cash that sits in bank accounts in in Asian countries. In China, you have 22 trillion US dollars sits in bank accounts in cash. 22 trillion dollars. That's currently 200% of Chinese GDP. Now, what if interest rates continue to fall in China? Real rates in China are 2.5%. Inflation's benign. We think rates come lower, and as a result, that chart I showed you on the previous page, those yields will continue to depress. So what happens to all this money? Where does it go? The savings ratio in China is 50%. In the UK, we're lucky to get double digits, if that. The same with the US. So the mobilization of savings over time is a really, really strong story. We always think about Asia as flows between the West and the East. This is the East and the East, of where savers in Asia, aging populations are an issue in China as well as they are an issue here. People will look for that yield as they mature over time. And we think that will force people into yielding assets. It's probably not great for property bubbles, to be honest, but they could easily build, come and go. Um, it's pretty good for wealth management. It's pretty good for life insurance. It's pretty good for equities that yield. As I say, there is a, a warning, health warning, that comes with that statement. Because clearly, if that happens in the next five, 10 years, then you know, it, it's, well, it's not going to happen in five, ten years. It's going to take a lot longer than that, but it's a very powerful story. Um, I've only got seven minutes, um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about China. Um, basically, we have seen improvements. Um, there's been a lot of uncertainty about where China is and what the levels of growth are. But on the whole, we think they're going to stabilize around 6.5% GDP, which is where we currently are. Um, and there are signs in the industrial sector, when you look at house prices and industrial profits, that that's coming through. Um, the PMIs, Purchasing Managers Index, services has been a good story for some time, but now actually we're seeing something more cyclical, a recovery. So we're seeing growth both in the industrial profits and in manufacturing. Sometimes since we've seen that, because you can see it's been on decline now for the last eight years. <coughs> For me as an investor, I invest in companies, not in economies. We're seeing improvements in corporate profitability. So companies have got less debt, lots of cash flow, sales growth is picking up. And this chart here just looks at the performance of the state-owned enterprises against private sector. And the private sector are growing sales at 23%, net income at pretty close to 40 and they're investing. The good thing about the transition and the reason why I think the reforms in China are working 
is that the state sector, which is pretty inefficient, is now not investing. First time that's happened in a long, long time. <clears throat> I'm not gonna, I haven't got time to talk about that. Maybe we can, <laughs> we've got some questions, maybe we can talk about that a bit later. But the other perception, I think, is that India is a terrific long-term structural story and China's a basket case. Um, I would, I would um, be nervous about making that. For the same reasons that Russ said when you talk about euphoria, um, to be honest, there's literally nothing in the price for China, i.e. this is price to book versus the region, uh, uh, versus return on equity. So China trades pretty close to its lows in terms of discounts to the region. It obviously, it can be at premiums. Whereas India sits at a 49% premium record highs, yet with this whole demonetization issue, I think we're going to see slower growth in India over the next three quarters. And earnings is the worst story in Asia. So you've got a market at record highs, earnings which aren't even showing any sign of stabilization. Unlike China, you could argue they're bottoming out. Yet everybody loves India and everybody hates China. So you talk about the optimism and pessimism story, here it is in a nutshell in an Asian context. But let me talk to you, let me finish off by talking to you about why I think income is the most compelling story in the region. I think the, the overall economic story is a good one. We are signs of recovery. There are some drivers there in terms of local people investing in local assets and local investments. Um, but this is the income story. Um, so Asian corporates have changed. Now, a lot of reasons why people don't invest in income in Asia because they're worried about transparency. They're worried about historical perceptions of debt, um, of overinvestment, overcapacity, etc. But things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. So companies that used to spend off the chart, we can't even go higher than 16%, but this is CapEx on the right. So going back to the late 90s, during the tiger economies of Asia, CapEx was off the charts. Companies were investing in new capacity which wasn't needed, golf courses, nice office buildings. I went to some terrific office buildings in the early, in early 2000s. That was a sell sign if ever I saw it. Um, <coughs> but now that's roughly in line with the rest of the world. Debt, which I think is, is quite interesting but, uh, for another reason, but debt levels in Asia are now at record lows. They're lower than anywhere else in the world. I think this little spike up here, again, being a bit nervous about the US, is that why when we have no capital investment in US equity market is corporate debt rising. And partly that's a lot of companies borrowing to buy back shares. You know, very, very short term. You know, if interest rates do go up, is that sustainable? No. As a result, is the earnings growth level we've seen in the past, is that sustainable? I, I have my doubts. So Asian debt's very low. But because we have no debt, no capex, cash flow is going through the roof. And dividends, as we all know, gets paid out of cash. Doesn't get paid out of earnings. Earnings is accounting trickery. But cash is tangible, and cash is what pays our dividends. So as cash flow goes through the roof, cash flow here in Asia is higher on a, on a free cash flow yield basis, basis than it is anywhere else in the world. But Asian companies pay out less of their profits as dividends than anywhere else. So my expectation is that earnings in Asia is an, is a, is an OK story. It's not a great one but the dividend story is a compelling one. So my belief is, is that dividend growth will outstrip earnings growth compound over the next five years. Basically, because these payout ratios move higher in line with the rest of the world based on the fact that companies have excess cash. So if we have five or 6% earnings growth, which is not heroic for Asia, double div digit dividend growth is more than possible. Um, and I don't think you'll get that kind of income growth anywhere else in the world. This is uh, just a couple of examples of companies we, we, we invest in. Um, and you look at the earnings surprise. What we do at Henderson Far East Income, we spend quite a lot of time trying to find companies which will surprise us with dividends. Um, and this is just a, 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 we can talk about companies later, I'm sure, either over a drink or over a panel discussion. But there are lots of companies in Asia which are surprising. Uh, with dividends, it's, it, and, it, and that's, that's not a big surprise, really. When payout ratios are that low, estimate, estimates are quite conservative. Not that difficult to find companies that will beat those conservative estimates. So we use dividend surprise as a catalyst 
for capital performance as well as for income growth. <clears throat> um, and just the last chart on dividends, really. Everyone assumes that Asia is all about growth and cyclicality and trade and all these lovely things and beta. Um, and to be honest, it has been. This is a chart that just looks at the contribution to total return from dividends and from capital performance since 2000. So Australia, US, the world, Europe, Japan, where basically, despite the fact that the markets are at record highs, that actually dividends have been a large part of your return in all of these markets. Asia is the only market where actually capital performance has outstripped dividend performance. I would argue over the next 10 years, it will be the other way around. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sure if we want to have a chat about further about the other 25 slides I've got on here, I'm sure we can. But thank you very much. <laughs>